all right so here's our second uh employee video of the trip um this was another one that i wasn't really ex i was kind of expecting this one but it was still kind of thrown at me impromptu the way it all came out um but back at the museum um our characters today are max who is 89 years young and still sharp as a tack. He was the head of the service department at the Charles City plant, so he's got a lot of good stories, lots of them. We barely even scratched the surface with him. Um, he was kind of like, to get him going, was kind of like watching a dam break. First a little chunk fell out, and a little water started seeping, and another little chunk fell out. and A couple more chunks fell out, and the next thing you know, the whole dam let loose, and he just, he got out he got himself on a roll um there is a little bit of meandering a little bit off topic but it's kind of hard to cut some of it out because all the meandering leads back into more stories so it's kind of hard to edit all that out for in the sake for the sake of time so a lot of that's going to get left in just to have some sort of continuity through the story um so we've got max dennis is back um this was act this actually took place right after we left him in the last video we walked up out of the tractor room back up to the front desk of the, the museum there and max was waiting for us um and then later in the video dean walks in um and he sits down at the far end of the table and then a little bit after dean walks in cliff shows back up so we ended up with four guys total by the time this video gets done um like these guys actually talk so long my camera overheated i've never had that happen in i've had it happen like outside like it happened out at ran tool when it's outside and hot and in the sun it's the first time it's ever happened um inside um so the video kind of cuts off at a weird spot but um i had to leave to get back up to osage right after this to catch some more people so you only missed about 15 more minutes of conversation and then we parted ways so you didn't miss much um so about halfway through the video we were sitting there at the table by the front desk um and they just max showed up and he just started talking and i didn't really i didn't want to interrupt that because that's clearly where they where those guys go to sit down and drink their coffee whenever they're hanging out there um so i didn't want to take them out of a place they were comfortable in and interrupt the process and take them to a different spot that might be quieter. So unfortunately, about halfway through the video, a uh, tour group showed up and there's probably like a 10 minute stretch in here where there's going to be people talking in the background as that tour group shuffles past the front desk and goes off into the museum. And then it gets quiet again after that. So it's not a huge inconvenience, hopefully. Um, so yeah, Max, Dennis, Dean, and Cliff. And uh, Max actually hired Dean into the plant twice. That's the running joke, he hired him twice. Apparently it didn't scare him away too bad the first time. So uh, anyway, without further ado, here's these guys. Anyway, I went back, we rebuilt the department, things were going pretty good, and then of course these people decided that uh, we, we can't can't run this company from from a uh, Charles City, Iowa, and so they they uh, bought a place in Oak Brook. There's a right didn't people. buy they leased it. You want to cut one? Place in Oak Brook. It kind of looked like a uh, uh, prison. It was big wall and everything. It was really first class. I thought, gee, why do they want to spend all that money? For this, but you know, these people are big city people, and so that's the way it went. But again, uh, I I uh, was going to 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 move. The department was going to stay at Charles City, and then uh, I was building a house, and I couldn't quite get away to move right away. <laughs> Besides, my wife didn't want to quit her job, so again, we terminated. And then, then, when it, then when it all come back to Charles City again, Freddie called me and wanted me to come back and set up a department again, which I did. So I left Sukup at that point. 
And then it wasn't long that they, they wanted us to move to Coldwater a while. So I, I guess not. I'll take the severance package. But they weren't too anxious to give it to me. So, because uh, I had had the other severance package. But, but my daughter's an attorney, and so she represented me, and we got some. <coughs> Got it back. So what was the last year that you worked for White? Uh, let's see. I'm 89 years old. I worked for them nearly 30 years. So, 85 maybe? Yeah, somewhere in there, I suppose. I worked for Sukup two different times. After this other thing, I went back to, back to Sukup. And I was director of marketing for them. So of course, '85 had been two of their <clears throat> tough yeah. years, you know, bankruptcies and stuff. Anyway, I worked for 17 years for Sukup total, and I worked uh, uh, 29. You count the severance, 30 years for Oliver White. Mm -hmm. So I had a long time at work. I'd say you paid your dues. <laughs> yeah. Well. But there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that I, I did that helped me, you know, just to enjoy life. Uh, I retired at about 70, and uh, I worked with the Historical Society in Marbrock. We've got a pretty active place, and it isn't as big and grandeur as this, but we've got several buildings full of stuff, and it worked pretty good. And I was uh, kind of a, a techie, and I started the, uh, when I worked on the board for that historical society, uh, it was just everybody was starting to have a web page. So I developed a web page for them, and uh, also did some other technical things to help them get started and so forth. And, then I got on the city council, and geez, I wrote programs for them with the computer, and, and uh, one of the things that I did is I wrote a, a story every month, and I'm still doing it, but for the Mobrock Journal. It's a, a, a little newspaper, a legal-sized paper that's distributed to everybody with a 50653 zip code, which is Marbrock, and they get this for free. And then people said, you need to put all those stories in a book. And so that's what I've got here. Nearly 100 pages of stories that I I've talked, talked about. That, so I haven't been sitting around. Well, that's pretty incredible. You know, I can see it take, took a lot of time. <clears throat> well, I tell you, I started this, uh, I, I went into to print the first time at the end of uh, uh, October, first part of November of last year. And uh, it, I started it two years earlier, finding all the material, but then I, my wife was ill with Parkinson's and she passed away, and so I kind of put it back on a shelf. But I worked on it intensely uh, two months before uh, I got into print. And uh, so, and I've sold, sold uh, I had, had 150 printed. It's kind of a Marbrock person type thing. Yeah, you could spend all day reading this. Yeah. Local bank robbed, 1942, huh? <laughs> That's the type of thing I, most of it was about. And, but like the next one here, gravel pit. Mob Rock, right south edge of it, is sitting on a, uh, several miles of gravel 
along the Shell Rock River. And when they built the railroad through there, they built a spur down to this area and they dug out gravel for, for ballast on the ties and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's been quite a thing. Mm -hmm. It went into after they took their spur out and was done, why the city got it and uh, they used it as a landfill. So it's, there was a first television in, in there. Talk about outhouses. I remember those. <laughs> I was just a little guy when, yeah. when we finally got a bathroom. Yeah, our house. I wasn't going to do this, but I will. <laughs> oh, you did a fantastic job. You got some nice pictures in there. Well, those are things I learned uh -huh. when I was at Oliver and. Um, I was writing manuals there, operator's manuals and you, you shop probably, manuals. And you probably knew uh, Tracy Sweet, right? Yeah, because he, uh, that was his job at uh, making Tracy manuals. Tracy Sweet worked for me twice. Oh yeah, yeah. He also had a photography business on the, on the side, and so he uh, was a photographer. Tracy Sweet is another married. story. Oh, that name, was he the one that did a lot of the plant photography? That, yeah. name, that name sounds familiar. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know if he's still around or not. I, I don't know. Tracy Sweet I hired him the second time for a technical writer, smart guy. And, uh, and then the management decided that they we needed to regulate the number of people we had was, was building some in, too much inventory in tractors. So the Chicago office says, you got to uh, lay off some people. Well, of course, Tracy Sweet wasn't a, working in the shop, but every time the shop took a hit like that, management did as well. And Tracy was my newest employee and I had to lay him off. His this last day at work, was May 15th, 1967. And his wife was pregnant. He had a broken leg, he was walking with crutches. Here is the last day the guy got laid off. I, I was new to the job, and that's the first person I'd ever laid off like that. So anyway, uh, our working hours were to 4.30, and uh, Tracy put in his day, the last day of work, and, and he had his stuff that he, personal things from his desk and all that. And he was going down, and his wife was gonna pick him up on E Street. There's two entrances to the plant. One was on E Street, and the other one is on Lawler Street. So he, he went down there. And then uh, a little while before that, uh, a fellow came in from the, my uh, from the place next to me, which was the experimental department, and there was the engine test cells there it was in concrete. Anyway, this this guy come in. He was in the model shop, and he had been a dynamometer operator. Real clever guy, building things. Anyway, he came into my office about 20 minutes after four, and he says, we've, we've, we've read a new low barometric pressure for, the, for, Mar for Charles City here. When they run uh, uh, horsepower tests, and they used, at engines, they had to record temperature and barometric pressure, and, and so, he came in and he said, we recorded a new low. And there was a barometer in the, the, the men's locker room there. It was a laboratory type barometer, a great big thing with mercury in it and diaphragm to, to, to check the... Anyway, the bottom line is a new, new barometric pressure. And so, to me it was kind of a ho-hum thing, I guess, because I was more worried about Tracy 
being laid off, first guy I ever did, and he had a broken leg, and his wife was pregnant, and oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I was working at the office, everybody else had gone home at 4.30, and, and I was working at the office, trying to get caught up in paperwork, and uh, then I heard the, this noise, people, and uh, uh, the tornado hit the plant, just on the, on the west end. But I, I stood there and looked out the big windows on our office and see the debris and everything like this. And I, my goodness, I shouldn't be standing here. I should be in one of those concrete test cells, you know, because it looked like it was pretty serious. But anyway, it sounded just like a locomotive. That's what I always heard a tornado would be like, like a locomotive. So uh, uh, I stood there and it, it stopped and the door from the number one shop was, so I could see that from where it was and everybody was just piling out of there like mad. And I heard some of them say that it came from Marble Rock. That's where I live. I thought, oh geez. I need to go home. So I uh, went to go home and my car was parked on E Street and coming out of the personnel office there, here was Terry or Tracy Sweet. How about out there? He says, my wife was supposed to pick me up here at 4.30 and she never showed up. I'm worried about her. I said, I'll get my car and we'll go look for her. So my car was parked several hundred feet away and I went to get it and come back and got him in the car and then we started going off on E Street um, north because we figured that if she was coming, she would come in that way. And she was on the other end, the other entrance and was had, was sitting there waiting for him. And uh, they had mixed up on which entrances they was go he was gonna come out on. He was at E Street and she was at Lawler Street. Another guy that worked for me was um, Jerry Pfeiffer. And Jerry's car was parked up mm -hmm. off of Lawler Street. And he got up there and here he saw uh, Tracy's wife in their car and he knew that there must have been a mix-up the tornado is, is on his way and so he, he opened the door on the car and said, he told her to get over and, and he says we'll go find Ted, Tracy she was in tears and couldn't figure out where he would have been so they went out and the, the tornado hit the car and, but it didn't damage it so they couldn't drive it and I had got about a half a block from where I pick him, picked him up because everybody was trying to get their cars and get to go and everything was plugged and, and I met met them and then uh, he got out and got in with them. But that where she was parked was the major, the major damage to the plant. It knocked this whole wall down if she'd been packed beside that, it could have been serious for her, so. Now, did did she, did this tornado pick her car up while she was in it? Well, you know, that's a controversial. It says in uh, uh, one of the sources that I got, and it talks in there, that the car was picked up and jounced and was up in the 10, 20 feet, I don't know, back down, mm -hmm. and the tires were blew out. When I saw that car, the tires were not blown out, so I don't know. Many years ago, the reason I say this, many years ago, Tracy gave a talk about, you know, toy farm and stuff like that. It was a tornado, mostly about the tornado. And he, he, he told the story that when she was there at North and Main Street, when the tornado hit, it picked her, the car, up. Yeah. To where she was looking down on the top of Jacob's elevator. 
That's great. Elevator. I heard that story too. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know if that was his wife, but yeah, somebody told me that story last time I was here. And then it came. She came back down, and maybe that's when the tires went flat. I don't know, but. Well, uh, the article I, I read was was that, but I I I felt a little bit. I didn't. I don't know. I remember put the whether I put that in there or put it because when I saw them, there were no flat tires on that car. Yeah. Well, that's a story that he told, you know, so. And I saw Tracy Sweep hobbling out of the office on his crutches. He said his wife was to pick him up 430 on E Street and didn't show. I told him I'd get my car and go as we did. And Sherry and Jerry and Jerry and another member of the department was parked on the other end. When they came out of the building, they saw Sherry waiting and recognized it. There must have been a uh, mix-up about where to pick Tracy up. With the start coming, he jumped into her car and drove her from the building to E Street. At this point, the storm hit, and the entire west wall of the shop fell down where she'd been parked. The falling building life and steel could have easily killed her, and it landed with such force that the, oh, the car picked the picked. Let's see, the wind picked their car and it up it landed with such force that the tires blew out. And I said here, I question the report since the tires were not flat when I met them a few minutes later. I, I don't argue that it didn't pick it up, but I was arguing was I don't see how he, they could have driven around the plant to pick him up with, with four flat tires. Yeah, this was after the tornado, yeah, right? Yeah. So I don't know. Huh. Well, interesting anyway. <laughs> as long as everybody survives, sometimes you got to embellish the story a little bit to make it sound cooler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's one of the stories that's in there. Someone called me about this and wanted this story. Uh, who do you work for? I don't work for anybody. Okay. I'm just me. Well, there's a guy that uh, writes for the, that all, the Oliver Magazine, and uh, I sent him this, this story. He wanted to know about the tornado, so I don't know whether he did anything with it or not. So you said you started in 1955. What were some of the first things you were doing there? Okay. Yeah. A large group of retirees just arrived. Well, I uh, was talking to Mr. Stokes about the job. Well, they're not in the building yet. He wanted me to start Monday. Yeah, they're out there getting on the bus because they have to take the wheelchair one at a time. Could it be a week from Monday? Why? I said, my wife and I are getting married Saturday. And we got a honeymoon plan to go to the Black Hills. Oh, yeah, a week from Monday would be fine. So. What I did there, it, I started, I was a service department clerk, and I could type, and we had, I think, 12 branches at that time, and these 12 branches were, ran like 12 little companies, they had their own books, and whether they make a profit or loss or whatever. And so we had, when we had a, uh, a program, they had one about the cylinder heads on the diesel engines. There was a, a problem with, that was compression or what, I can't remember. But anyway, they had a stack of credit memos that, that had to be typed, uh, carbon paper and, uh, and sent sent the credit through the organization to, so that they would get credit for all the, the expense that they had due to this problem. We went back to uh, to get the money, some of it from from uh, Waukesha Motor. It was a manufacturing problem, as I recall. And uh, it was our design. Those engines in those days were. Uh, designed by our uh, engineering department, but 
something was wrong with the compression that was in the head. So, a number of tractors had to have the heads changed. So I would write these, type these credit memos up. That was one of my jobs. And then in those days, there was no such thing as a copy machine. And so they had what they called a portograph machine. It was about the size of this table here. And when they had a, a problem, I shouldn't say a problem, when they had a, a need to bid a, a government or military contract, they only got one or two copies of the, of the, of the uh, information you had to fill out and, and to bid this contract. So they'd bring it down to the service department and on this portograph, why well, it was a photographic process where I'd put the original on the glass and then I'd hit a, a button and it would expose it to a, a piece of paper that's photosensitive. And then I would, this is in the dark room, and then I would take it out and put it in the chemicals and I would have a black on, with white writing on it for the, these contracts. Then I would take those uh, like a negative and I could make X number of copies for the plant to, to, to review to what, uh, what, what they wanted to bid and how much and so forth. So that was one of my, my jobs. So as I worked there and that, why? Then they needed help on working on the parts catalogs. So I started helping them with the parts catalogs. And at that time, they were uh, come up with a problem where, uh, again, not enough uh, people selling tractors, so they needed to cut back in production. And I was about a man on the line, or probably get laid off, I thought. And so, they didn't because they had to get these manuals, manuals out. So what they did is they took foremen out of the shop. That uh, some were college graduates, some are most are not, but they had some talent, and they brought them in there, and they would make technical writers out of them, and they would write these manuals and all, all that. They did a pretty darn good job. Now, since you're talking about parts books, I got a question. So on the parts books, you've obviously got your blown up parts diagram uh -huh. that looks like actual. How did they make that picture of all those parts blown up? Okay. Well, that was before my time, but there was a, a John Darwin was the service manager, and he was an engineer, graduate engineer. And he came up with this, this idea. You take the thing apart, have all the individual pieces. And then there was a table about this, this big with a piece of glass on top of it with lights underneath it. Who's bothering me here? And, uh, the guy that always bothers you. Anyway, <laughs> when they, when they uh, put these parts the out, Help you laid them out a cup of on a 45 man. degree angle. <laughs> and then when this, they would take, the photographer would take a picture of them, and then uh, he'd give you the negative and you'd tell him how big you wanted it. They laid down a card, maybe about this size on there, and the, you know, based on this card, You'd say whether you want it twice as big or, or uh, only once time the size or whatever. And uh, then he'd make prints of that and then you'd cut them out and then you'd lay them out on a, on a piece of cardboard, white cardboard. So it's quite the process. It was quite a process, yeah. And when uh, we went to microfish on uh, all the catalogs, why they wish that they would have had a 
draftsman somewhere draw these, but uh, it worked. Mr. <laughs> Don't call me that. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. Paying them your sights. I, so I, I, I hired him twice, yeah. if you believe. <laughs> he didn't learn the first time. <laughs> Uh, we had them kind of started training them and so forth. And this Cletus Shaft was an ag engineer. He was a graduate engineer. <coughs> and uh, there uh, was a uh, Oliver dealer that, that was had its basis in southern Illinois. And they owned, I think, two or three dealerships. And they owned the Spear Bend Company. And they bid on a contract for Nigeria. And this contract was to clear some of the, the jungle and install irrigation equipment. And they, I don't know how many, 4150 tractors went over there. Uh, I would say at least 15, maybe 20. To Nigeria? And they sold planters to them and field cultivators and, and everything. Four one fifty. So part of the deal would be is that we had to send a service die to there to train them on operation and train them on service, and that uh, they were to have a shop there and uh, and we shipped over uh, I don't know thousands and thousands of dollars of repair parts that they might need. And so, anyway, uh, they contacted me, the sales department, and wanted to know who we had that we could do that with, to send somebody over there. And I said, well, we got this young trainee, he's a graduate engineer, lived on a farm, he knows all equipment and everything, I would say Cletus is the guy, okay? Approach him if I doubt if you'll know. So uh, he said, yes, I'd like that. That'd be interesting. It was Nigeria, that's where they were going. And uh, so we got him trying to trade him in overseas to travel and work and everything. And so uh, he, he took off for Nigeria. In those days, there was no fax machines. You, you did everything by teletype. So we got a teletype from uh, Cletus that he was there. That was good. So then, in a, a couple weeks, he telegraphed back and he says, this is a joke. There's nothing for me to do. I just as well come home. And so uh, he, I said, well, you bet. Come home then. And so we went to the airport and tried to get on the plane and they said his, his papers were not in order. They couldn't board him. You had to go to the, to the uh, not the embassy, but the office of the embassy there and get your papers in order. So he went there and they said, there's nothing wrong with your papers. They're okay. Okay, so the next day he was there at the airport again and went up the counter and then the guy says, you still don't have your papers in order. Oh, geez. So he went back and didn't know what to do and he was sitting there in the, in the lobby and, and a guy from one of the other vendors, the irrigation guy, and said, Cletus, what are you doing here? I thought you were going home a couple of days ago. He says, they won't let me get on the plane. My papers aren't in order. He says, did you bribe him? <laughs> and he says, no, I didn't know you had to. Come on, I'll get you on that plane. So he took him up there and, and gave him some money, and the, the papers were in order, all, all in order of, all of a sudden. And he came. And so he, he came, uh, he got a boom, and, but, he, but he was a few days late because of, of this little thing. So I said, what, what was the story then? He says, well, first of all, when they're clearing this jungle, they're just taking and pushing the, the trees down and, and there could be roots and stuff like that still in the ground and they would burn, burn the trees. 
And then they try with our field cultivators and tractors to try to, to work that ground and they pick up those roots and it was a terrible, terrible mess. So they had to figure out another way of getting those roots, roots out of there. And it's in Nigeria, very hot, humid climate. But you know the 4150s all had air conditioning. But when we ship them, they disconnect the, comp the compressors so that you don't leak free on. But they didn't know that. They just didn't, they just didn't work. So their solution was to break the windows out of the cabs of the tractors. Uh, and, uh, Brand new tractors. Yeah. All the windows smashed up. So anyway, uh, uh, he said, that now this building that they were supposed to put up as a shop hadn't been done. And all those parts that we shipped over were underneath pieces of, of roofing steel laying up against a tree. And those parts, thousands and thousands of dollars of parts were there and probably weren't going to be able to use them. The good news was that Caterpillar had already been there and, and trained them on the engine. So, but anyway, the elephant went bankrupt over it. Lost everything. Wonder what's with the tractors and stuff. You think they're still laying there? <laughs> they got cannibalized and cut up or what? Well, that's just like another deal. We was involved with a souk up, and this was in, in uh, where they're warring now. There in, in uh, I can't think of the name. Haiti. Haiti. Huh? Haiti. Did you go to Haiti? Or was it down no, in Haiti? No, this this was in a uh, country that was a part of Russia at one time. They're fighting oh, there. Ukraine. 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 Yeah, and we sent. Uh, like fans and heaters and stirring machines and all that kind of stuff over there. And somebody else was sending, oh, Stormar was sending bins. And so that was what was gonna to happen to, to when they got the grain out of the field. So Tom Jensen, uh, who worked for Sickle, the service guy, was to go over there and, and install the equipment and, and get them going. And, and when he got there, the, the crates had all been opened and the, anything that was that they could use for something else, they stole it. And so there was nothing we could do. Most of the stuff was gone. And uh, yeah, that's kind of the way that a lot of that stuff goes when you, you don't really have control of it. No good deed goes unpunished. So, anyway, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> Whatever you got, spill it all. Oh, well. <laughs> I just have to be back in Osage by noon. That's my time limit. <laughs> Were you involved uh, in the Vietnam well, tractors? Uh, uh, Dean should tell you about uh, the Nebraska test. We, we built the 250 and uh, uh, had a uh, uh, Perkins engine. No. That had the Moline engine. Well, uh, the 250 had the Moline engine, 585. Yeah, yeah. it had, it had the 585 <laughs> engine that was made in Canton, Ohio. No, the 585 was made in Charles City. They transferred that down from Minneapolis, you know. But the 478 and the 135 was made in Canton. The, the well, anyway, they, it was a joke, these engines, <laughs> because the, their, their tooling is all, all worn out, and the, they wouldn't. Now, if you listen to the Moline guys, that was all Charles City's fault. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, they replaced you guys were, it finally you guys with the Cummins machine. engine and made a, a real tractor. Yeah, when we came with the Cummins in the 100 series, it was just unbelievable, the performance. And these guys, uh, I understood, when they trade and get a new one with the Cummins engine, the fuel consumption mm -hmm. went way, way down. Well, it was really good. But this is a little off story on that. Uh, there was a time that Bob Prunty, who was the chief engineer at that time, and I, and Jim Wormley, who was the vice president of operation, no, vice president, period, of our company. And he had with him Dick Brown, who was the vice president of operations with him. This, this uh, Wormley flew his own airplane to go to these all these places. And so we all met at, at uh, Canton, Ohio there, 
and try to hold these people's feet to the fire, first of all, is to try to get our money back from a lot of this stuff that we were. were that was on the 2150s, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, maybe that was. It had a planetary on the outer wheels. Yeah. Yeah. That was 21. Okay, so we went there and through a meeting, and I mean, it was just a waste of time. They weren't going to give us a dime, you know, to, because these things are falling apart. So anyway, Mr. Wormley said to Bob Prunny, he says, how are you guys getting back to Charles City? And he said, well, we'll get there same way we got here. We got tickets to fly, fly into O'Hare and then from O'Hare to water. He says, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to ride back to, to O'Hare with me. I said, he said, Bob, uh, we, 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 we got these tickets and everything. We, we just said not do that. Uh, he says, you're going to do that. Okay. So we got into his little plane. And there was four seats. And there was four of us. And so we, we took off. And then we went over uh, a lot of ground. And we were on the border of, of uh, Illinois and Indiana. And he started circling around. And they... He and Brown kept looking around at what was on the ground. And finally, they saw what they wanted, and we landed in this alfalfa field. <laughs> and here come this Cadillac out to meet us, and this Brown, it was his parents, their farm, and he, he uh, was going to be the weekend with them. So oh, left him off at so the farm. <laughs> he left him off there. Well, then... Prunny got up in the front seat with him, and he was lobbying all the way. Don't, at those days, a small plane could land at O'Hare, but it, you had to be a super pilot and know what <laughs> you're doing with all these other big planes and so forth. <laughs> no, he was going to take it, sir. Oh, geez. <laughs> and, and anyway, so we took off, and then we got over South Bend, and it was getting dark. And these planes were holding around there, all of them. And it just looked like a bunch of uh, fireflies. I mean, mosquitoes or something. I mean, there were so many of them. And he finally said, I think maybe I should just take you to Chicagoland, or I, I normally land. You guys can take a taxi over there. Oh, was that a, a relief? So he, so he took us down, and it did. Uh, we took that in. And I thought Prunny and I had had it for sure, you know. <laughs> what was this, after that? This, this crash was, landed. The yeah, I gotta say this. Wormley then, we had uh, all of the service people, all the territory managers, come into a meeting here in Charles City. They rented the Salisbury Auditorium and had uh, I don't remember what we were introducing. So anyway, he was the uh, kickoff speaker. This Jim Wormley, and uh, so. He was, we were supposed to start at nine o'clock, as I recall, and he wasn't there. <laughs> and they didn't know where he was, why he was. And at, at uh, 9.30, he wasn't there. At 10 o'clock, he wasn't there. And about 11 o'clock, he showed up. He never said a word about why he was late, and he put on his part of it to, to open and kick it off, and it was really good. But what had happened, he was going to land at Mason City and then take a car over to Charles City. For some reason, he didn't want to land at, at Charles City. So anyway, an oil line broke on his engine and spread oil all over the cockpit windows. And he shut down because he didn't want to ruin the engine he was thinking about the engine rather than his height. And so he circled around and he, and uh, it was winter time, January, and he landed in a, a cornfield. And uh, not too far from where the, the, the big bopper and them were oh, really? crashed and killed. And he landed, landed there, he got his papers and his briefcase and he walked out the highway and he thumbed a ride for someone to bring him to Charles City. <laughs> But that all took time. So that was our experience again with Mr. Wormley. Well, was he must have been quite a character, huh? Was he? Oh, geez, he could be awfully mean, too. But 
here's the story that after uh, he had this accident, Cleveland office put out a, a directive. No you will not no. fly your own airplane for any any company business. And uh, he also said if you wanted to uh, go by charter, you had to have a pilot and a co-pilot, and it had to be a two-engine aircraft, and then it had all these kinds of requirements. <laughs> and then it said you could use the corporate jet if you uh, if it was free for your trip at a dollar and nine cents a mile. That was pretty cheap, though. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, my experience with Termley, normally he he was. He had a short fuse, I'll tell you. When we first introduced, uh, introduced air conditioning in the tractor with an air conditioner up above, of it, you know, I, uh, there was a the dealer sold this, this tractor with this cab uh, down in Kansas somewhere. And his wife didn't want him to buy the tractor. But he convinced her that it was a good deal and he wouldn't have to hire any help this year that she could run the tractor for him. And it's got an air conditioned cab and it was nice and pressurized and clean and everything and so uh, this would, would be a good thing for us. Okay. Why are you laughing? <laughs> yeah. So then he put her to work uh, plowing first thing with that tractor and she'd been to the high dresser that morning had her hair all fixed. So with the plow, you know, there's one wheel down in the furrow. And so she went to the, to the end of the field and turned around and go back to the other side of the land and when the other wheel went down and this dirty water out of the <laughs> evaporator <laughs> pan came down all over her hair and face. And uh, she went back to the house and she called Jim Wormley in Chicago. <laughs> and then it, then it come down to you. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, uh, Wormley had told the, the uh, operator there that anybody that uh, uh, has a problem, he wanted to talk to him. So he got the call, requested. And then he called me and he says, <laughs> we got to fix that tractor. He knew we had a kit to, to put a foam pad in that pan and, and uh, uh, make some changes on the hose and stuff like that. And uh, he said, I want you to have a man out there and have that fixed yet this afternoon. <laughs> okay. So I called James, uh, Dwayne Starr, the service manager, and says, uh, who you got covering that? And he said, well, it's... Uh, Rudy Volkman, but oh, yeah. he's he's three hours away. He says that's the only guy we got. I said you better get him on the road then. <laughs> so Volkman went over there and it took him three hours, which was later in the day. And she called Wormley again. Oh no! <laughs> and said I thought you was going to have a man out here to fix this this afternoon. Hmm, I did too. Let me check it for you and I'll call back. So Wormley, he says, if you don't have a guy out there by, by an hour or so, you can look for a new job. <laughs> so fortunately, Rudy Volkman showed up in. and fixed the thing. So I don't know who paid for the hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was a deal, I'll tell you. Another story is about the Turk. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Turk or not. Apparently not. Well, there were three or four dealers in uh, Wisconsin that would buy, I would say, two to three hundred tractors every every spring, and they leased them then to a green giant. And this was uh, uh, when the the 1850 was first produced that they they bought a bunch of these and put them out. And the there was a problem in the injection pump, the adjusting the rollers, and then it poked a hole in the side of the pump and you had to put a new pump on. Hey, how are you? Well, this the Turk had this business 
He was a, an Oliver dealer, and he had two employees. One was his wife that did all the book work, and the other one was a, a, a fellow that was pretty uh, mechanically inclined, was his shop manager that took care of all the service calls. So he had to go out whenever one of those, those pumps poked the hole out to the side and put a different, different pump on there. And he ended up with, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 pumps. They'd go into the service station and they'd be repaired and then they'd come back out and he'd have to put it back in inventory. Well, he didn't want 20, 30 injection pumps because the problem has gone away, you know, and so he's stuck with those. So the, the, the service manager from CAV and myself and uh, the, Ray Larson, the service guy from there. Mm -hmm. We went in and, and talked to the turf, tried to get this resolved, because he wanted labor too and travel time and all that. And uh, this, the CAV people were something else. They never saw a problem. Never saw a problem at all. I got another story about them. And uh, so we, we, we were there and we was talking to them and and he said, we're not going to pay it. We're not going to take the pumps back. And uh, the jerk, uh, the jerk was kind of funny how he talked, but he says, you son of a bitch, sir, you're going to take them back. And boy, that's the first time I ever heard him swear. But he really did. And you know, he got him to take them back. And we had to pick up the, the, the labor and the travel time. Travel time. Bit, but at least he got his money out of them. So, anyway, we had other problems with the, the it was a, really a popular tractor, the 1850 with a, a Perkins engine, but there were some, some little things that went wrong. One of them was that, that uh, we didn't know what, the, what it caused it at the time, but the, some of these tractors would have kind of a little flutter in the exhaust. And this, uh, there was a Dutch Dutch uh, farmer over in Northwest Iowa that had a, one of these that he, he didn't like, and they and uh, the CVC. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with the pump. There's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. It's and we got out there and talked to this farmer, and and he was giving him the. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that tractor. There's nothing wrong with that engine. There's nothing wrong with that injection pump. And the farmer had all of it he could take. He said, sir, I want to take you out here to the shed where I got the second one of these tractors in. They're supposed to do that. This other tractor doesn't do that, so you better fix it then. <laughs> so we went out and he's cranked it up and oh, sure it run just nice and smooth. And, and it was, and the problem was uh, we, we finally got learned is that the, sh the shaft uh, drives the injection pump off the dry, timing chain or gears, I guess, probably. I don't remember exactly. But anyway, there was a little bit of uh, play in it. And when that went idle, that would go back and forth like that and make that, that, that noise. And so I imagine there was thousands of them that made it and no one ever did anything about it. But the last 600 that we built of those why they they put a new engine in there that had everything fixed. They had that fixed, and they had the intake manifold on one side and the exhaust on the other. Others, they were all on one side, and that doggone exhaust manifold would get so hot on that, it'd get red hot, and you'd get, get that intake manifold expanding and contracting, and it would take the, the gaskets. And then suck a bunch of dirt in. Yeah. So that was another little That's problem. good to know. Yeah, but I don't know what, how they ever satisfied that uh, judgment out there, but, but evidently they did because I never heard any more about it. You talked about the 585 engine in the, in the 2150. You made a comment that the Minneapolis people really thought the problem resided in Charles City on that engine, but I don't know if Dennis, my brother-in-law, worked on that group of engines 
machines that came from right. Minneapolis. I remember them being in the Lake shop Street. up there. Yeah. 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 I was a, a electrician assigned to assemble those machines that came in and uh, I am not in any way making any comments on the people that were employed at Minneapolis, but <laughs> the machines in the process of being moved suffered anomalies. It's referred to by some people as sabotage, but the point is they weren't in the condition that they manufactured engines in in, in Minnesota that they arrived at Charles City in. And uh, I didn't have to deal with the mechanical issues as much as the electrical issues and hooking them back up the controls panels and the control stations and the machines found a lot of things you had to sort out wires crossed and wires crossed missing mislabeled and and so forth and it's understandable the people in Minnesota had lost their livelihoods to the to the process that wasn't the only time in my life and I know in Dennis's where Things like that happened in my career as you went on. Um, no, it, it didn't help. That you, I think that was a pretty good engine, that 585. Uh, it was a pretty good engine, and it continued to improve through <clears throat> time by uh, engineering updates. I know they made a lot of irrigation units, yeah. too. I remember yeah. seeing things kept the that 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 speed that up. That guy shut down and moved to Arkansas, and, that, and, yeah. and the, <clears throat> the, 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 man, the foreman but went with it. I had a young son Fisher. in yeah. high Fisher. school that worked for Dean and his brother Larry in high school, and he really enjoyed working for Dean and Larry. One of the comments that my son Aaron made, and he enjoyed working for Dean and Larry, of all the equipment he had, they had that he worked on, he enjoyed the four wheel drive whites. He really liked a tractor that Dean and, and Larry's father bought new, and it was a, a Minneapolis Moline tractor that had one of those big G1355 engines yeah. in it. Uh -huh. And he referred to the throttle lever as noise control. It had nothing as far as he, he, he caught, it was a joke, but he said it, it wasn't needed as a throttle lever. <laughs> you just picked a gear, let the clutch out slow, and you use that lever for whatever noise level you wanted. It had <laughs> enough torque, you didn't need to use it for speed control. Strictly was noise control, <laughs> but uh, the engines that were built out of the machinery that was shipped into the Charles City plant were built on machinery that was very old, just like a lot of the equipment at the Charles City plant oh, yeah. that built tractors in Charles City. And uh, the move and the knowledge of the move that was coming probably slowed down maintenance on the machinery. And it took a while to get the machinery back in good mechanical condition. Uh, but that engine was continued to be built even after the tractors that the engines were put in. I, I wonder yet today if somebody needed to repair a part for that, what they would do because Fisher had, had that, that was his business down there in Arkansas and eventually went bankrupt, I think, on it. And, and there's uh, a number of mini mo guys that are avid warehouse collectors that have quite a few, you know, salvage parts is what uh -huh. it amounts to. But uh, the engine is repairable today, but it's costly. Yeah, that's right. There's the. Key. You said, yes. you're saying Fisher. Was that that big dealer down in Stuttgart? Yeah. But this Fisher, he worked at the plant. He was the foreman. Supervisor over the 585 or the, the mini mo line, and he went with them down to Stuttgart to yeah to reset the plan up and yeah get it going. And, and he would work for him he for made, a long time, quite a while. He made engines and you know, yeah. I guess I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. There's a real lack of understanding among uh, most of the people in the world today that consider themselves informed between torque and horsepower. You can drop a hitch pin in a draw bar on a tractor or you can let the clutch out in a car and get uh, things accomplished with horsepower and torque. But the experience is radically different if you've got torque or horsepower without torque. And 
torque means that uh, things happen before it can break. Horsepower means that you can wind it up and with a lot of noise and excitement get something done. Horsepower happens at the top end, torque all, torque all comes to play at the bottom the end. The Minneapolis 585 had torque. The white Hercules motor had kind of a combination, a little bit more engine okay. speed, had a lot of, right. a lot of torque and they used the speed. same combustion system. Yeah. They used that man, uh, man combustion. That was a, but yeah. one of the Patrick Oxford Nuremberg. That was a German design. One well, of that Canton, Ohio is the thing that really ruined the company. Yeah. Is because so they they uh, put a hundred million dollars into uh, new design transmissions for trucks and and there was some stuff that they did for our engineering. And they were developed this new engine, so this corporate, corporate, corporate engine. And this corporate engine, the only thing that you could see was a lot different on it, is the timing gears were on the rear of the engine instead of on front. They thought that was a, a, a big deal, but I didn't like it very well because it's a service thing. You'd have to take the engine out if you wanted to get in there. But anyway, they, they was going to have a corporate tractor as well. Anyway, that engine plant that they built there in Canton to build these engines cost them $100 million. And what did Perkins pay for that when they bought it? I don't it? know. I bet it wasn't a 10 cents on a dollar. But then they spent another $100 million in Torrance, California at the engineering oh, center to build, the, build these engines. I don't think they ever built one engine in that that plant, well, sure, yeah, I don't they, went, they went bankrupt over it. Anyway, and all the money they spent in the foundry here, tooling up to pour castings for that plant. Yeah. I you guys were working on that all the time, weren't oh, you? Oh yeah, we, yeah, they had that uh, sitting there for I don't know, a lot of years, just sitting there. You know, another use some of the floor, floor space for storage and stuff, but and they use the heat treat furnace. But, uh, Another big mistake that uh, uh, I think Wormley made this one is that they, he was told by the sales department that the 550 engine or 550 tractor, I should say, uh, was not competitive with the other people that were importing uh, Bullshit. tractors. There was no differential lock for one thing, but that was about the, the major thing. That, but. To, to fix that, it was going to cost two and a half to three million dollars to, uh, they had the design that they could do this with. But uh, Wormley says, no, I'm going to buy these tractors like the other people do. Fiat. So we did, we got in bed with, with Fiat and uh, we had to train Fiat on the reverse yeah. idler because that, you that, in? that these tractors are used in livestock I don't think your group wanted you to floaters, go outside without them. Uh, to remove manure and so forth. And the uh, Fiat tractors were never Do used you know for that. Is? And so the reverse idler would, oh. would wear you know out very quickly. No. And so the thing that got here, that though. fixed, and I'll be darned, like that was uh, or a or good seller. We had dealers in California and the vegetable areas there that would would sell three to four hundred of those tractors a year. What you, you told me once, Max? What percent of the tractor market did we have in Co-op Federay that was it, Fiat? It was, it was nearly fifty percent with that with that with tractor. Fiat tractor. Yeah, Fiat tractor. Well, I said in a meeting one day with the the wheels from Fiat and our people. And they they were talking about very things, and the the one guy says, "How come you're not selling uh, our bigger tractors in in uh, the farm areas?" And uh, it was explained to him that we build tractors too. <laughs> well, that didn't sound good. Huh? And we build our own for that. Oh, that's why we don't. Okay. Uh -huh. So they weren't happy with that answer. Within a year, they canceled that contract. And went with Alice. And, and what they did then was they went with their own organization that oh, they set up right. through Heston. They went 
uh, to these dealers and says, we'll give you the same tractor you were getting and so forth, except it'll be a different color. So all these dealers that were selling four and 500 of these tractors a year, and Co-op Federy was the first to go jump board. Really? Uh, and uh, they, they dealt direct with, with them as well. And so that was a big mistake. Then White made the similar mistake on the White Freightliner truck. Their uh -huh. most popular truck that they had, and they didn't build it. They was buying it, and they they closed the, out with a change yeah. of contract. Freightliner too. Industries. So then White had, had to hurry up and build a, uh, figure out how to build those Freightliners. So trucks are a little different because a lot of that stuff is picked up and put in just assemblies. Yeah. White White couldn't make a good dis good business decision if it smacked him in the face. So. Well, yeah, but they made you know. I often I kind of defend White in ways. They put a tremendous amount of tooling in the Charles City when they came with the 135, the they planetary did. final tractor. Yeah, Would right, that have right. fallen under White Motor though? Would that have been White Farm? Because weren't well, they kind of too? That was White Motor. That was a. That was yeah. a that was a good deal. That got okayed out of Cleveland, you know. You spoke about the 550 tractor. Um, there was an electrician that was working with me by the name of Ron Grossbeck, and before the white line of tractors started being manufactured, one day uh, Ron Grossbeck and I was given instructions by, at that time, uh, electrical supervisor by the name of uh, Al Colbert to start unhooking the 550 line of, elect of uh, electrical controls to the 550 line of transfer line program. transfer line of, of machinery that made parts for the 550 line and so we had worked for about two days carefully taking off the control panels and the electrical panels and hooking them from the uh, plant and labeling the wires very carefully preserving the integrity of the machines when Al Colbert came through and saw how much progress Ron Grossbeck and I had made on unhooking and taking apart these machines and he he was in a rage. We didn't understand the instructions we thought these machines were being moved, as we had done many times in our career, to some other location. It's going to be hooked up and put in service again. These machines were being, as he put it, being sold to the Jews in Ohio. In other words, they were being wrecked. And uh, he wanted them taken out of service, unhooked from the plant electrical system as fast as possible. And he expected to see almost all this line of machinery ready to be loaded on scrap trucks and we had a few machines unhooked, labeled and preserved. <laughs> Boy was he upset. Wow. And I had never in my life unhooked electrical panels with hacksaws and yeah, torches. Saws saws. <laughs> yeah. Well we didn't have saws. <laughs> saws, saws. <laughs> yeah. Boy did I not understand you my know, work that instructions for that day. Was first built was the the best tooled machine tractor in the, in the United States, it was it was the Super Fifty Five. Yeah, that was the better than anything anybody else had. That's why they were starting to buy these things overseas because they, they they didn't want to spend the money like we did to, to build the tractors. Well, Dennis will remember, and Dean will know, and you knew when they built the last runs of these things. There were two forty fours satin all over Charles City. They had them lined up around the plant and rows and the fields and everywhere all over Charles City. It was the last run and they were gonna make enough to be sure that they could sell them throughout their dealers and so forth for months. And in short order, they were all sold and gone. And I think it surprised the management, but we couldn't make them anymore because after two days of carefully unhooking and preserving machines, 
Hal made himself clear, and Ron and I had the rest of the machines ready to load on the scrap trucks in about one more day. <laughs> I was about half scared I was going to lose my job if I didn't get with the program as I understood the new directions. Yeah, you, were, well, you were probably writing the shop manuals and stuff for the 555, yeah, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Super, would have been, would they, did they make 55s or did it? Did, it was, or, yeah. But then they went Super, to the Super 55 was the first one. Oh, Super, Super 55. Yeah. There's no 55s. Yeah. Then they went to 550. The engines were changed from the three and a half inch board to three and five eighths. Okay. Uh, yes. See, my out at the farm there, my neighbor was Paul Lockie, my dad's neighbor, and his son was Gene Lockie, the head of engineering. He always had a nice 55 out there. I was so envious of that when yeah. I was a little kid, you know. Yeah, I, I was involved with a thing like that, too. I've been involved for years with scouting, in the scout camp that was oh, there at Bob Rock. Yeah. And George Burge was the uh, plant manager at that time. And here I am, a little clerk in the service department, and they, they, they asked me to go up and see if they would provide a tractor to our camp to mow grass and, and uh, mow snow and stuff like that. So I made an appointment with Edna Ladd, his secretary, and I had to talk to, uh, to uh, George Bird. And uh, I had with me a fellow from Marbrock, Arnold Stout. That oh, was yeah, on the board big, there. Big, and, and we, we made our, our pitch about should use an Oliver tractor there because the John Deere boys at, the, at uh, Waverly, they, they, they've got all their equipment in there. And, <laughs> and he and Bird says, well, we, we don't want any up here. So he said, yep, we'll provide you a tractor for a dollar a year. And he said that uh, it was it'd be, and when we come with a different model, a new model, this was a Super 55. We'll provide another one with, for you at no charge at the same time. Just trade in the old one and, and okay. the dollar you're paying. All right, so that, that, was, that was good, good, got the tractor and it was working with it and everything. Then we went to the 550 and uh, Arnold knew a little bit more about the contract and he says, you know, they, they need, they owe us a, a, a 550 now. We'll bring the Super 55 back and, and so forth. And would you contact your Mr. Bird about that? Yeah, okay. So we had another appointment come in and they want this, we wanted a 550 now instead of for the contract. And he, he pulled the contract out of me. He says, I just happen to have that here. You know, you were supposed to pay us a dollar a year. And you never made one payment. <laughs> oh no! <on> that. <laughs> he says so. I'm not too sure how how uh, you folks operate there. And Arnold book out his billfold and, and he, he five dollars came to it. I said, there, it's paid. Now. <laughs> yep. Okay. It's so what went, went through. Here's your five fifty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I spoke with Jerry Bill this morning, and like a lot of people, he initially was uh, pretty hesitant to talk to you because of his memory, as I've expressed about myself. But he did bring up the fact that the pattern department had done a tremendous amount of work on the engines, the four-cylinder and the six-cylinder and the, the V8 of the two different sizes of the eights for the advanced products and these these engines and heads had been poured cast here in Charles City and an experimental had put these things together and if you will spend the time and can be lucky enough to hit on some subjects he's got a lot of information for you but he was in charge of the pattern shop here in Charles City and there was a great deal of uh, experimental and first of work done here for APD and a lot of things right here in Charles City. And that's the place a lot of the cast iron little trinkets was done for the uh, golf tournaments and so forth. But uh, 
Jerry Bill would keep you busy for a half a day if you could just get him going and, and keep him going. Yeah, really nice man, a lot like Max here. You can just get him going. It's like a hit and miss engine. If you just give him a little bit of a kick once in a while, <laughs> he's got a lot of information for you. Max, do you remember who was it APD that developed the over under hydro shift? I mean, the hydropower was that that was developed. Gordy Bosco, John. He did. He was the guy on the over under. Wow. You know, I was thinking about that the other day, and that used you know it's used right up to the end on any of the you know we just change a few things but yeah. is did he come up with that idea of that you know I, I don't know who come up with the idea but but did he tear apart I was thinking them English bikes with the three speed you know the low was that did he tear one apart oh this might work or something you know the, you yeah. know where they lock up the the, the, the sun gear on that and, and they had to keep it in the same size as the hydropower you know that yeah no, uh, Gordy was the, the project engineer on that. Really? He's uh, passed on, by the way. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd be interested. I thought maybe Vince Weber was one involved in that, but it was Gordy there. Yeah, uh, Vince and yeah, Hanson. Les Hanson. Les Hanson. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that brings up another I, little story I remember. When we went to the 1800 Series B tractor, why well, we went to uh, sleeve mounted gears yeah. and the, the compartment for the differential and the transmission were separate. And there was a great big seal on the pinion shaft to keep it from doing that. The oil where it's supposed to be. Well, when they took the first ones off the line. Green Giant had bought, I think, 20 of these and with the differential flipped so that the, it, it run them backwards with their sweet corn picker. Oh. And it's four, they were four wheel drive, which was, we were the only ones at that time that, that had that. So anyway, one of those tractors, the oil was leaking. The bullpen took it apart and found out that when they put that shaft in and everything, it's pretty heavy, and it rested on that lip and tore it, and so that's why. So uh, they had ten of them at uh, Lesur, Minnesota, and ten were at Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. And Les Hansen and I had to go to Lesur and Keith Race, who was the other transmission guy at that time and I don't know who went with him maybe somebody from the build then anyway uh, and we had to tear down oh uh, five of these bevel and check <laughs> and check and see if if uh, the that seal was tore and so uh, of course less he's he used to sitting at the, the drawing he didn't board. Let it get dirty Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> Orson. And we were we were t working on the first tractor and their shop was lousy because to get to that there you have to do everything except take the tubes out of the tires, you know. <laughs> and so we were working on this and he was working on the front end taking the sheet metal off and I was the back end pulling getting that big long shaft out of the yeah. out of the tractor. And it went all the way through all that. And I heard Les crying, I want to make a note of that, get that changed when I get back. Hmm. So I walked around there, what's the problem, Les? And the blood was running off his hands, and, and he's looking for the, the kit, the magic kit, and he, he tore some of his hand on top of the hand on some of that sheet metal, and it had a sharp edge. <laughs> and, and I said, Les, I could have come over to your drawing board and bled all over you about this, and you wouldn't have been interested at all. But since it's your blood, it makes a difference. So I don't know whether he ever did. Ever change him and lock and room. These but the good news was, we got the first one done and it was okay, and they were working on the second one at, in the, at Beaver Dam, and both of them were okay. 
and so they shut us down so we didn't have to I don't think we did the second one. Maybe we did. I don't remember. <laughs> oh, that's but, a job, though, to get yeah. down to that. <laughs> that was quite a, quite an interesting little deal. Were you involved in the Vietnam project where that order never got shipped on the 1555s, where that, that order was you built? Mean, they never built them even? They had the engines? They, they, no, they built the tractors, and they didn't get shipped, the 1555 okay, tractors. No. I wasn't involved. I, I know that when they stopped building the 1555, we had 100 engines. And, Left over? Yeah, and so we gave them to uh, vocational schools. technical schools yeah. around the country to, for service. Clarence Hossie, our service manager at 